Tunic is in many ways quite a mystery. It doesn't play all of its cards outright. It doesn't tell you exactly what it is at the forefront. And so by this game's nature, any discussion of mechanics or goals or equipment is kind of a spoiler, at least a little bit, since so much of the game is about learning the game. That creates a bit of a challenge for someone trying to review it because I want to be able to explain what the game is and how good it is, but of course I don't want to give away everything that makes the game actually enjoyable to experience. I'm going to try and handle that balance as best I can. I'm going to walk that tightrope. I'm not going to spoil anything major, anything too revelatory or significant in terms of the plot or the major mechanics of the game. However, I will have to give away at least some of what it is to play this game, at least some of what it is to experience that first half. And so if you wanted to go in completely, completely blind, then you probably shouldn't watch any video on Tunic and you should just dive in and just give it a shot. But I do think that an understanding of what the game is on the surface level is useful because you may not actually enjoy what that is. It kind of depends on you. If you're less inclined toward the mysterious aspects, if you're less inclined toward decoding reams of information, then you would need to know like what it is at the center of this game that makes it fun or not, strictly from the sense of a game. So watch with caution, but know that I'm not gonna give away too much. A game like Tunic makes me think very strongly of expectations, about the way that, in so many ways, expectations is like putting on a new pair of glasses. It orients our focus, we can't see or notice everything all at once, so we temper our own view, or at least narrow our sense of what we expect to see and what we expect to matter. And so in many ways the sort of expectations that you have going into any experience has such a strong effect on how you perceive that experience and what matters. In Tunic, the first thing you see is this green tunic garbed fox figure hero. And this creature you're playing is seemingly young and by visual reference clearly a nod toward the classic hero of Link in Legend of Zelda. And with that visual cue comes a strong expectation of an action adventure game with a bunch of dungeons, a set of magical gems to collect, equipment to employ, and environments to traverse and retraverse as you learn how best to use each piece of equipment. And in that way, the first expectation the game sets is the first that begins to shift. The puzzle design is not quite so explicit as a classic Zelda game. You're not entering a wide variety of dungeons each themed on a certain element like fire and ice and earth. Instead, you're weaving in and out of the overworld and underworld and back again, and you're engaging in combat that is difficult and requires a great deal of attention. It's far more like a Dark Souls game than it is like a Zelda game, in spite of its name and in spite of its appearance. You have a stamina meter, like a Dark Souls game. Dodge rolls and holding up your shield use up this stamina. When the stamina is drained, you take extra damage, which in itself incentivizes a controlled use of the stamina meter. There are altars you find, similar to bonfires. You drop currency upon death. You return to whatever the last altar that you lit was, and you must recollect that dropped currency. It's not quite as brutal as Dark Souls in terms of cost of death, but death carries a cost nonetheless. You even end up with health flasks that refill at each altar. The Dark Souls influence is clear. The Souls-like traits of the combat doesn't fully detach the game from the spiritual link that it holds to Zelda. Back in the day when Zelda first came out, its design was something new and fresh. It wasn't predictable the nature of the dungeons that you were going to be venturing into. It wasn't initially predictable the types of equipment that you're going to get. And now that there has been Zelda game after Zelda game, it's become much more predictable over time. Tunic recaptures some of that initial mystery, that relationship to the world wherein you feel a necessity to seek and discover because not everything is predictable. What counts as a puzzle in this game is less clearly delineated overall. You start off the game like you would any Zelda, exploring the immediate environment around you, blocked off by bushes and tunneled to an eventual weapon to fend off foes. But when you walk up to NPCs and signs in expectation of in-world guidance, you receive gibberish, a language you've yet to learn. You eventually stumble across pages of a manual to the very game you're playing. It's an immediate fourth wall break in the design. You are in an untranslated adventure, as if a bootleg item of immense rarity that you've stumbled across. And you are playing this bootleg game, and you don't know what the language entails or what it is that you're supposed to do or what it is that you're supposed to fight, but you continue to push forward because that in itself is part of the excitement of the journey. And the manual is your supposed guidance, and yet this guidance is as cryptic to you as the many NPCs and signs you've already come across. 
And so your aim is left unknown, your goal untold to you. The overarching villain of this adventure is more the emptiness that resides in your knowledge than any singular enemy you could otherwise face. The lore itself becomes something you're guessing about from moment to moment, and progression continues in this way throughout the entire game. The pages that you periodically stumble across become like the equipment of past Zelda games, except now the significance of each item is less a new maneuver for your character than new knowledge for you. But this knowledge is not guaranteed, or at least it's not explicitly told to you, and so you could miss the meaning that's trying to be given. You have to do the work to decipher it. One way to view the early going experience of this game is that of a kind of treasure hunt. You're given clues to treasures within a limited environment, but you have to try your best to understand those clues in order to make progress. The deepest puzzle you engage with is to do with your own understanding of the space that you're maneuvering through. There are types of dungeons, there are things that almost look like dungeons, there's a kind of overworld, but the puzzles in those dungeons is actually not that obtuse in and of themselves. The challenge from these dungeons and these tighter spaces has much more to do with your own lack of understanding what it is that you're fully trying to do. If you continuously go back and forth between this manual and between the game, it will give this sense of like a full layer of guidance that's always available, so long as you're willing to try, so long as you're willing to experiment and toy with the possible meaning at play within that guidance. It makes in the early going for a kind of limited sense of adventure. The feeling is almost as if you're being told too much. Every step of the way you know that this manual is going to give you the answer if you're just willing to look at it carefully. And even though the text remains fully untranslated, the gibberish continues throughout. There is enough image there and there's enough context surrounding the images, at least for the early portion of the manual and the early portion of the game, that you can generally figure out most of what it is that you need to do. But there's always this overarching sense that you could be missing something. Now that's really what drives the early portion of the game, the sense of missing something, the sense of needing to discover the, the idea that there could be a revelation around any corner if you're just willing to venture there and give it a shot. And that's really what makes the game initially so exciting. Even though the combat is challenging and stiff and careful, it feels worth plotting through that otherwise slow progression in combat in order to get an opportunity to receive new information. The yearning here is for that next page, not merely that next piece of equipment. Equipment. There's a lot of fun to be had in the adventuring in this game. There's a, a steady forward momentum that you get to experience and enjoy. However, it's important to understand that this is not going to be the puzzle-centric adventure that you would have hoped for if you were expecting a Zelda-type game. The puzzles are fairly light, it's really about discovering how to move forward and what to do next. That's where a lot of the challenge comes in. A lot of the experience is going to be much more like a Dark Souls game. In some ways you need to embrace going back and forth through spaces you've been through countless times before. You really are going to become excessively familiar with many of these spaces, and the only aspects that are going to be unfamiliar are the things undiscovered because you have yet to decipher them within the manual of the game. The thing that is the cornerstone of this entire game's mystery is this manual that you have access to. And it looks and is written and is organized exactly like the classic manuals of old that used to come with every single game. Where you would have those long drives home after having bought the game and you just get to sit there and open up the game early and look through this manual and you get a preview of what's to come. And in seeing that preview, it triggers your imagination. What might be all the uses of these mechanics that are being outlined in this manual? This game captures that again. Because so much of the entries are untranslated and must be determined through context, you the player are looking through this and you're reading and you're trying to imagine what it might mean and what it might entail and how it might relate to what it is that you're doing in the game. And there are slight scribbles here and there as if it was like a booklet used as if someone was there before you and you're kind of getting a trace of a history within this booklet and that becomes part of this world. Part of your ability to determine how best to decipher many of the elements seems to be helped along by someone in the past and it creates a kind of relationship to someone that you don't even know, a complete stranger, an element that I think comes up again and again in the style of the mystery of this game. 
And with the book the way that it is, with so many of its parts untranslated, it really kind of suggests that you can figure out many of the secrets on your own. It in many ways implies and in some ways guarantees revelations all along the game. The manual is a kind of like selection of difficulty or choice over how much guidance you want. You can try to figure a lot of these elements out on your own, and you can try to just look at the world and decipher it on the ground directly. Or you can have the manual sort of give you hints here and there. It's one of those things where you can decide for yourself to go through this book and to treat it as a foreign guide of some world that you've yet to explore and with elements that you've yet to understand. Unfortunately, not all of the actions that you learned from the manual can be learned directly from the game world itself. There are some things where you really have to read the manual to actually understand what to do, and that's a bit of a shame. I, I kind of would have liked it if more and more of the clues were actually diegetic and in the world and not completely just built into the manual explicitly told to you. Throughout the whole game, you're seeing these words and you're seeing them untranslated and one of the expectations I had was okay, maybe they would get translated down the line, but the words never get translated for you. You have to decipher them for yourself. And you will get enough information down the line that yes, you probably can decipher many of them, but it's gonna take a while. There's a level of inference and mystery required in this game, especially in the second half. The mystery that's there in the second half is far more than at the beginning of the game. Thus, the intrigue of the manual is not fully revealed for quite a few hours. Hours. I don't know if I found everything yet and that's fine. That's great. There's a tease of more. The internet is its own kind of accessibility option. At any point I know that if I get completely stuck, if something is too esoteric of a challenge, I can look up online and we have amorphous crowds of various strangers online ready and waiting to help. To sort of help decipher this game together. And that is such a wonderful thing that this game is pushing people to work together in order to understand it. It's not all just put there at the forefront. It kind of reminds me a lot of these alternate reality games that existed for a while. And these are games where they cross various mediums, where they use websites and real world telephone calls and real world locations to garner a kind of mystery where various people in the real world are going to interact in order to understand something. The first Halo 2 trailer that was revealed showed a link after a glitch at the end of the trailer to this on-screen I Love Bees website. And suddenly for many people who are already following this strange mystery around this website, there was a hint of direction. The joy in much of this mystery is that the mystery itself is not clearly outlined. In Tunic, the aspects of the mystery you are meant to care for and attend to are not set, and you must think for yourself every step. And in that way, it's an example of managing space. It allows enough uses for a given area so that future knowledge leads to alternative angles of seeing that area. Old becomes new. You begin to see with fresh eyes. Metroid or Zelda-like games have always had that kind of recontextualizing space built into the core of their game mechanics. But in this game, you're not just recontextualizing the uses of that space, you are constantly re-understanding what the game even is. You're recontextualizing meaning. You're discovering the ways in which you've inadvertently mistranslated what's around you. It reminds me a bit of the philosopher Quinn's radical translation idea. There's a thought experiment where he describes translating the language of a previously unmet tribe. And so you see a tribes member looking at a rabbit and pointing and saying Rabiki or something similar. You presume that the translation for Rabiki must be rabbit because he's pointing at a rabbit. You see a rabbit, it sounds like a rabbit even in that particular example. And it, it sort of affirms your assumption each time the tribes member points at a rabbit and says rabbit. But of course, it, it's not fully determined. What this person could be saying when they're pointing at the rabbit, it could be food, it could be finally, it could be movement, it could be rabbit in the sense of a religious icon, it could be any number of equally valid and fitting translations. And so the weight and value of distinctness attached to the word is unrevealed. In that sense, confirmation of translation doesn't come easy. There's a necessity of ongoing experimentation required to falsify guesses in order to lean toward better explanations. And this game is full of you doing that kind of process. You're seeing language used in certain ways and you're experimenting with potential translations of what that use might be. You're taking a best guess for practical reasons, and language is almost always this way. We don't look up the definitions of the vast majority of the words we use. We learn through use. We make assumptions about each word's proper use, and then we employ those words until a contradiction arises. And so use of language is an act of perpetual inferential thinking, a socially bound act that requires feedback constantly from others. It can't merely be a private series of references to perfect inner thoughts or sensations. It has to be bounded and held within the confirmation or rejection of others. And this game gives you that experience of what language does by constantly giving you external constraints on your potential interpretations. As you play Tunic more and more, you're going to be throwing out possible meanings behind what the interpretations of these symbols could mean. And you're thinking continuously about context. 
but it's not a completely empty context. It's not completely blank. You're pulling from the inner vocabulary of many years of gaming. So much of the initial puzzles that you're figuring out within this mystery is how to equip weapons or how to dodge roll or how to run or how to use checkpoints and even the way health vials refill. And this stuff comes very directly from prior experience with other games. Much of the experimentation comes from just knowing how games generally work and then trying it in this game and then seeing what works out. There's a lot of comparisons being made between this game and Fez and they both are extremely similar in that they play with a foreign language and it's about you learning how to use that language in order to progress. They're similar in the sense that they both have an ostensible game at the surface which is like a kind of puzzle or action adventure game but what's underneath is a much much deeper puzzle still. Your expectations are constantly shifting and the reveals are overturning what you already thought should have been there in the first place. The bulk of the twists and turns and revelations occur after the most of the game is done. You really get a full game even if you ignore the main parts of the mystery, the parts of the mystery that are hardest to understand. And so the actual deep dive into what the mystery fully reveals requires a voluntary sacrifice of your own time. You're deciding to personally reward yourself through pursuit of this mystery in order to decipher the full text of the manual. But why play this way? Why bother to go beyond what's already on the surface of the game. The game is already showing you a kind of like Zelda-like experience. That should be enough. It's a conflict that seems to be at the very center of what this game is trying to be. It's a conflict between following what everyone tells you to do, following the obvious direction, the violent direction, the one that leads to glory and reward, and following a direction of truth seeking, of just wanting to know what's really there, what's really out there. How good is it as a straightforward game versus as a mystery? It's a question you sort of answer for yourself. It's a question that bounds all our choices in life. It's a conflict between what kind of life do you want to lead or what kind of adventure do you want to have? If you want a straightforward adventure, you can play Tunic that way. You can get really good at the combat. You can collect a wide variety of equipment and powers and weapons, and you can use them boss after boss and collect the main pieces of gems that you seem to be seeking, and then you can end the game that way, and that might be enough. And the only hint that there's more is because the ending can be quite dark. And there's this sense that you really are making the decision for what kind of game you want this to be. If you want to be a game about truth seeking, about just finding what's actually there, what actually exists, then it's a completely different game entirely. It's really about you managing what you decide to take for granted. Are you just going to fight or are you going to discover? Are you going to take what is given to you as axiomatically true or are you going to decide to push back against what's taken for granted? Push back against what you're told and actually find for yourself the truth at the corner in the nook in the very center of what this game is.